shed is open, and we hope you'll come visit. In the meantime, let us bring the aquarium to you. Let's dive into the mysteries of the Great Lakes. What makes the Great Lakes so great? What is the food web in the Great Lakes? What threats do the Great Lakes face, and how can you help protect them? Let's find out. Many people know that Chicago is a city on the water. Even though it looks like an ocean, it's a freshwater lake. It's Lake Michigan to be exact. Lake Michigan is part of the Great Lakes system. There are five massive lakes between Canada and the United States. Lake Superior, Huron, Erie, Ontario, and of course, Michigan. The Great Lakes are great for so many cool reasons. Did you know that our drinking water comes from the Great Lakes? Wait, we drink lake water? Yeah, we actually do. The Great Lakes provide drinking water to nearly 40 million people. Almost three million people live in Chicago alone. Humans aren't the only ones who rely on the lake, right? That's exactly right. There are 139 native species of fish and 30 native species of amphibians that call the Great Lakes ecosystem home. Plus, birds use the Great Lakes as a rest stop to recharge and refuel during migration. Wow, the Great Lakes support so much life. They really do. Wild rice even grows in the Great Lakes and has long been a culturally important food source to indigenous peoples like the Ojibwe. Now that we've learned so many reasons why these Great Lakes are great, we can dive a little deeper. Besides visiting Shed, of course, what do people do when they visit the lakefront? Let's pause to discuss. There are so many ways to enjoy the lake, right? Walking, bird watching, playing, and don't forget fishing. Right. Freshwater fish are an important protein source around the world. Here in the Midwest, there are several species of trout, there's perch and walleye that you can catch in local waters. Lake herring and lake whitefish are both popular for fish fries. We even have a weird eel-like fish called a bourbon. Its nickname is the snock rocket because it's so slimy. But they're still popular at fish fries. Have you ever fished on the lake? Have you ever eaten fish from the lake? Take some time to tell each other about it. Fish from a healthy lake can be a great part of our diet, but let's learn a little bit about what they eat. Let's start with the basics first. What is a food chain? I'll bet you know. Now let's break it down by comparing a couple of local food chains one from the lake and one on land. At the bottom of every food chain are organisms called producers. These include plants like grass and plankton. This is probably the most important level of a food chain as it's where the energy begins. Let's take a closer look at this foundation by comparing grass and plankton. They're similar because they both get their food from the sun using photosynthesis. This is one of the reasons they are both green. They're different because plankton float around absorbing the sun while grass stays put. So far, we've learned that plankton and grass are producers and they are the foundation of the food chain. Next up are the primary consumers. These animals eat producers. Rabbits eat grass, and invertebrates eat plankton. Let's compare the primary consumers in each of these food chains. Do you notice similarities? How about differences? Right after primary consumers come secondary consumers, and then the rest of the food chain has some pretty hard to pronounce names, like tertiary consumers and quaternary consumers. Just so you know, Tertiary is a big word for third, and quaternary is a big word for fourth. The secondary consumers are the predators. Fish, like yellow perch, a commonly caught fish in the Great Lakes, eat invertebrates. On land, foxes eat rabbits. So now we're at the top of our food chains. Take a minute to think about the similarities and differences between these predators. A 
Okay, we get the idea of a food chain. So next is a food web. That's gonna be big. It's big, very big. A food web is all of the organisms in an ecosystem that produce energy, get eaten, or do the eating. You can see the predators, the producers, and the prey that we learned about. Now, take some time to make your own food web. This is an example of a food web. It shows a shark, seal, fish, and plants. The shark eats the seal, the seal eats the fish. The fish eat the plants. Sometimes sharks can even eat some kinds of fish. Have you been part of a food web? Have you eaten something from a local ecosystem? While humans aren't always included when learning about food webs, we humans rely on a healthy food web for much of our food. So what about when people say you are what you eat? Is that true? It is, but it's a little complicated. Like we learned, energy and nutrients start at the bottom of the food web. These nutrients are transferred from one organism to the next as they get eaten. The same unfortunately goes for pollution in our ecosystems. For example, if an invertebrate absorbs pollution from the lake while feeding, the walleye that eats the invertebrate will also ingest that pollution. This is why Shed and Partners are working so hard to advocate for cleaning up the lake and the river right here in Chicago. Fortunately, all of our advocacy has started paying off and the Great Lakes ecosystem is so much cleaner than it was 20 years ago. We and future generations thank you for that. Thank you, we're really trying. Thank you! And since we're talking about the Great Lakes ecosystem, let's look at our food web again. Food webs are delicate balancing acts where if there are changes at the base or the top of the food web, it can throw off the whole balance. What do you think would happen if a new species came in and ate 10 times the plankton that all of the other primary consumers were eating? Introducing a new species can cause real harm to an ecosystem. Wait, this could really happen? Unfortunately, it can. So what happens when there's a new species that comes in and it eats way more plankton? What do you think could happen? Well, I guess if, a, if another consumer came and ate too much plankton, then there wouldn't be enough plankton for other animals. That's exactly right. And we have a name for this type of organism. It's called an invasive species. Invasive species? An invasive species is an organism that has invaded a well-balanced ecosystem. These species can get moved by natural processes like large storms, but usually humans are responsible for accidentally introducing species. Unfortunately, in the Great Lakes, we have several invasives, but let's talk about the mussels. Zebra mussels and quagga mussels were accidentally introduced in the 1980s by shipping boats from the Caspian Sea. Invasive species are very hard to combat once they're introduced since they throw off the careful balance of our food web. Since being introduced, zebra mussels and quagga mussels have been able to reproduce really quickly and outcompete other organisms. They also need a hard surface to grow on and some can even cover native mussels, making it hard for them to eat and reproduce. And like we discussed earlier, they do eat a lot of plankton. A healthy and biodiverse Great Lakes ecosystem allows the plants, animals, and humans that rely on them to thrive. We've discussed so many ways the lakes are beneficial to humans and to wildlife, but let's learn a little bit more about how we use the lakes. People who live alongside the Great Lakes use them in many ways. I like to go to the beach because it makes me happy. I really like to swim and look for rocks and build sand castles. I like to go to the beach and water ski and eat ice cream. Take a minute and talk about how you use the Great Lakes. Humans use the Great Lakes for their livelihoods, as a source of food, as well as relaxation and recreation. 
Boating is a very common recreational activity on the Great Lakes. Manually operated boats, like canoes and kayaks, are common in nearshore areas, and power boats are common for fishing, water skiing, and just having fun. The Great Lakes are beneficial to humans for so many reasons, and these same reasons are why this massive water system needs our protection. If we want to keep enjoying the Great Lakes, we need to learn how to conserve them. So how can we help protect the Great Lakes? Make sure to take your trash with you after a day at the beach. Be careful what goes down your drains. Participate in a conservation action day like a beach cleanup. Turn off the water when you aren't using it. Don't release pets like your goldfish into the lakes. And don't forget to share all the cool things you learned about the lake. Today we dove into the mysteries of the Great Lakes. We learned about the Great Lakes food web, how invasive species are impacting the lake, how important the lake is to our well-being, and some ways we can help protect these ecosystems. That's all for today. Check out one of our other videos and thanks for watching. We hope to see you at Shed soon.